Hello and welcome to our Plastic Injection Molding Parts Clinic, featuring our speakers John Sidorowitz, our VP of Inside Sales and Customer Service, and Glenn Miller, our tooling engineer. John has been with Eccentric over 10 years and is a technically minded sales leader and problem solver in all things manufacturing. Having a degree in management and a very diverse background, John understands the entire manufacturing process from design to final product and everything in between. Glenn has worked at Eccentric for two and a half years as a tooling engineer and quality control specialist. Prior to joining Eccentric, Glenn spent time as a CAD tool designer and a tooling engineer with over 25 years in injection molding. This presentation is expected to last approximately 30 minutes. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but you can use the questions field on your screen to ask questions during the presentation, and we'll try to address those throughout the webinar. We encourage you also to follow Eccentric Mold and Engineering on LinkedIn so that you can stay up to date on our latest blog topics and webinar schedules. I now turn over the webinar to our experts, John and Glenn. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is John Sidorowitz. So I got the agenda up here. It's going to be pretty um, open um, and interactive, so feel free to just send in your questions. Um, so essentially what we're going to do is, is kind of look at a part, um, describe how it's used, uh, show some of the challenges uh, either in design or on the tooling side that we encountered. You know, point out features, um, you know, parting lines or, or things to, to think about when you're designing your parts, uh, and then go through any questions uh, that you guys have. So we've got about nine parts today. Um, we may get through them all. Uh, we may not, depending on the, the questions that we get, but uh, um, we'll try to uh, get everything uh, in. And we already have our first question. So uh, is this going to be recorded and available later? Yes, it will. So um, usually, I think, 48 to 72 hours after um, after uh, we finish up here. So all right, with that, uh, we'll get started. So, so this first part we're going to look at, uh, it, it's you got multiple overmolds, complex overmolds, insert molding, and a lot of coring out with uh, structural ribbing. So uh, let me switch screens here, and uh, we'll actually kind of pull up the CAD. And so just kind of walk through this part. So this is uh, obviously to some sort of housing, um, and the face plates. So, uh, We've got the black area here running around. That is an actual rubber, so that that's an overmold onto the brown part, which is a substrate. Then we have this this rubber feature here for for grip or how it's going to be held. If we rotate this part around too, um, you can see we've got a seal that runs all the way around this part as well. So uh, we essentially have three areas that we're overmolding. So the challenge with this part was to how do we get material to all three places uh, at one time um, otherwise you'd be looking at multiple tools uh, four to be exact one for the substrate one for each of the three overmolds so uh, working with the customer we were able to create these feed systems uh, on the inside here that uh, ultimately you know feed through uh, feed through to all three sections and, and do this all at uh, one shot. In addition to that, we have overmolded inserts um, that were installed in the mold uh, at the time of molding. But when you're doing overmolds, uh, you want to find ways, one, to hide your gates. You really don't want gates on the outside, especially on cosmetic parts. And you're trying to feed multiple areas of the part is how do we get materials to those areas? Um, Glenn, I don't know as, if you have anything. As John that. said, we, we went back to the customer on this and we, we basically just asked them for um, areas that they could be lenient with the design so we could uh, add filler tracks and access points to uh, mold the overmold plastic in all three areas at once. Otherwise, as John said, you're looking at two, three, four operations to make this part and that really simplified things. So. 
Um, so if there's any questions or uh, anything, you can just submit them. Otherwise, we'll just go on and we can always come back to them later. Uh, like I said, this is, is pretty open and uh, it'd be, it's meant to be more intimate. So let me switch screens here. So our next part is going to be a, a custom insert that we had to overmold. So uh, the green part was uh, provided by the customer. It was stainless steel and the red is what was uh, overmolded on. And that eventually was machined to uh, a different shape. So uh, let's pull up that CAD. And... And John, while you're pulling up the CAD, there is a question yeah. about the previous part, and they're asking, oh. was there a texture on that first part as well? Um, if I recall correctly, there was a light blast on the the substrate, the the brown part. Here, I can flip back and yeah, that was, screen that's there. kind of a, a show part, kind of a, um, a monitor piece. That yes, it did have an amount of texture on that to give it more of a matte finish. Yep. It really won't show up in the CAD, but uh, it did. Uh, All right, so. So that, this is a this is a custom overmold piece rather than in some overmolded situations uh, we're simply overmolding uh, a standard off the shelf threaded insert or something like that. This is uh, something the customer gave us a custom piece, gave us the CAD model for it, um, including the, the area they wanted over molding. As John said, this was post machine, so we basically over molded a tube around the part. Um, we did go back to the customer and ask for some retention features inside the part uh, just to maintain a, a hold on that over mold material to that substrate, um, which they did and uh, worked out really well. And other highlights, just to, you know, the, the creating shutoffs and, and ways to hold um, that substrate or that insert in the tool. You know, we have a thread feature uh, on this end and not much landing to, to hold this in the tool and, and create a good shutoff, but it was enough um, that uh, that we were able to do that. And the other point just to make when we're, we're over molding custom inserts is you know the tolerance of that you know overall length and, and how it fits in the tool because once the tool's built and we fit those inserts we don't have a lot of room if things uh, have a, a loose tolerance that's when we run into shutoff issues we can experience flash or if it's too big it, it may not fit in the mold or, or smash components of the mold so you really want to have tight tolerances um, looks like we got a question that came in. Can we see some photos of the finished molded parts as well as the CAD? Um, unfortunately, not today. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, we can probably do that maybe the next time around. I, I don't have any pictures of the uh, of the actual parts and how they came out, um, but we'll take that down for an idea for next time. Good question. Any questions on this part? All right, like I said, if, if something comes up after the fact, um, just let us know. Let me switch screens. Um, so this part, it's uh, we've got a lot of barbed, um, you know, ports on it. Um, we had, you know, really thick sections that we worked with the customer on and um, a lot of actions. And this one, we're gonna talk more about how we handle barbs and, and parting lines and, and coring out, so. Right. When, you, when you've got barbs on a part, um, the last thing the customer wants on that actual barb feature is any type of flash or any type of seam line. So uh, what we end up doing on these is that uh, it's open and close all the way up to the end of the neck area. And when you reach the bar, we have a separate pull that will come off the end of that barb so it can be a clean conical shape without parting lines. Uh, so, you know, as obviously a hose fits over that piece and they want a good seal on that. So that's how we get away with uh, not having a parting line over the barb itself. Now there will be a parting line down the neck of the um, main piece there that joins the rest of the part, but uh, that's the best way to do these barbs. 
Yeah, so you'd have your parting line across here, but um, being that it's a barb, you do not want the parting line on here, as, as Glenn was saying. So these would be buried into an action or a hand load. An overall part, uh, well designed. Um, you've got a lot of structure there that was cored out. Um, instead of a big solid chunk, obviously, it would be a filling and sink nightmare. You've got uh, ribs with good draft on them. Uh, good support structure around the piece, um, and this particular design would uh, improve its fill and improve the cosmetic look and the, and the uh, function as well. Correct. Um, we had a question that came in. Uh, do you do overmolds on cables with connectors? Um, we've done it in the past. Uh, usually it's a, a little bit different process because we're under high pressure, high temperature, and that will typically melt anything um, so it's really going to depend I mean we've over molded parts with like bus bars you know brass connectors that type of things we can do um, another question did you use slides for all the size ribs so in this part um, all the ribs were actually formed with the core and cavity all the actions were were on these on these ports so um, you can imagine the split line going, you know, right to left and core and cavity opening up and down. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay, let's uh, go to... So part four, so this is a, a pretty long part, about six or seven inches long, had lots of critical features and multiple tiny little actions. Um, it doesn't look too crazy at first, but uh, let's let's pull the pull the cat up here. Part four. Um, looks like we had uh, another question would be helpful to see the molds as well as the parts, both the CAD and also in photos. Um, that's another good thought. Um, we'll, we'll take note of that and see what we can do for, for the next time. All right, so just a, a quick you know look down this part. So it's not a, a simple cylinder as it looks. Um, we've got... Uh, these interesting profiles kind of going through and then at the top here um, you know they kind of come to a head so all these were were critical to you know tight tolerance um, features in addition we have these rectangular holes that that run all the way you know around the part 360 degrees these are not in any they're not in the line of draw in any direction so um, the way this tool was built, it was built standing up, um, you know, meaning parting line, you know, down here. Um, these were all individual hand loads or loose pieces. So you can imagine, you know, I think there was uh, eight of them that ran, maybe 12 that ran around this part, two, four, six, eight of them. Yeah, and every, uh, every place that you put a hand load, you, you're going to have a, a parting line seam, a, a, a mark on the part, which needs to be approved by the customer. So that's all part of the process of here, here's how we can form these uh, radial rectangular features um, and we need to get approval on uh, specific parting lines and what they're going to see on their finished part. Right. So in this case we had you know basically a witness line or parting line in, in between each of these all the way around. So if you wanted a smooth surface on this, this outside um, area it wouldn't be possible with those features the way they are because you really couldn't pull uh, the actions from the inside of the part there was just no room and just the way it's designed uh, it, it just couldn't happen um, in addition we have this thin slot here um, so a majority of our tool is, is made out of aluminum a high grade QC 10 so when we get small features like these and, and, and thin areas like this or um, Features that are going to, you know, difficult to uh, demold will will insert out with steel. So uh, this tool had quite a bit of steel in it, just 
due to the nature of uh, of the design, especially when the core did it as well. So, um, John, we have uh, we have a couple questions about hand loads. Um, the first one is, can you explain the term hand load? Because some okay. of our audience hasn't heard yeah. that term in the past. And then secondly, how do these hand loads stay in place when they're in the mold? So uh, a hand load is going to be, you know, it's also hand pick uh, or a manual action. So um, in, in traditional production tooling, you're going to hear slides and lifters. Um, when you're doing prototypes, um, you know, single cavity type tooling, you have loose pieces that are in the mold. So we, we refer them to them as hand loads because uh, essentially it's, it's a piece that you load by hand into the, into the tool and then you remove by hand when you're unloading it from the part. Um, so that's what those are. Um, and how do they stay in place? Um, that really comes down to the design of the tool. That's all on the tooling side. Um, you, it's, I don't know, Glenn, so you a may. Of, a lot of times you'll have, uh, depending, depending on the situation, uh, you'll have a hand load with, you know, say a, a, a foot or other retention feature on it um, with multiple hand loads all interacting with each other. We we try to do things to where each hand loads a different size and shape um, with interlocking features so they all fit together but they can't be put in the wrong position, um, things of that nature. So the operator at the press doesn't have to guess. It's a very meticulous and detailed process where each hand load is put in a certain way at a certain time and removed in the same uh, opposite uh, way. And again, this, this helps the operator uh, not damage something or install something wrong. Um, and as John said, in, in more complex production style tools, a lot of these things are done with, with slide actuation, hydraulics, pneumatics, uh, lifters, things like that. Um, obviously it does slow the cycle time down. This has to be done on every shot, um, but it's the best way to get these fine details and things without ha asking the customer to manipulate their design too much. Now, right. Glenn, there's a question uh, about um, the demolding for this part with so much internal surface area uh, and asking also, how was the part ejected? On this particular part, um, you've got basically the entire length of the part up until that end feature is one slide pole coming out from the right side. It has all of that uh, long detail rib structure on it. That'll pull out individually from one end. Um, now, I specifically haven't looked at this tool recently. Uh, I do believe that's uh, still a hand load piece and it, we likely have a fixture device to help the operator take that off of that. And so it's nice and straight and doesn't damage the inside features. Um, so yeah, there, there's quite a, quite a process to demolding that. And like I said, brought prior to that, um, it's just as important the order in which you take these pieces off the plastic as it is when you load it into the tool. Um, but uh, I, on this particular one, quite a bit of hand work to get one good part off of this. And uh, as John said, we, we chose uh, steel on this in particular because there was going to be a lot of hand work and we don't want any wear and extra damage uh, as a result of that. The QC10 aluminum is very tough stuff. But in certain situations, you need uh, you need steel uh, to maintain the durability and, and lifetime uh, of the tool itself. So I think we've answered almost answered the next question, but maybe you can touch on it a little bit more. Are hand loads typically aluminum or steel? Really, just depending on the feature, or depending on the tool, depending on uh, the potential life cycle, uh, number of production parts to run. Um, that decision's kind of made at the forefront with the design team and uh, their knowledge of what the customer is looking for. Uh, if it's a short-term production tool or a bridge tool, uh, we'll, we'll do aluminum unless the uh, fine details and wear factor uh, dictate otherwise. Um, I hope that answers the question. All right. Let's, um... So the next part um, is part of a seatbelt uh, application, uh, one half of a housing that uh, is a substrate and an overmold. Uh, we call it a complex overmold just because of the, the required shutoffs and, and, and flashing. Uh, 
you know, that we had to prevent. So let me pull that cat up. All right. Uh, maybe let me change the colors here um, so we can see a little better. That didn't help. All right. So, so we have the the interior part, which is our our substrate. So that was uh, something that was run first. Um, so we take that piece and then fit that to the overmold tool, and the the, the green area that or the green part is the uh, the overmolded rubber that uh, was kind of skinned over this part. Um, this um, is obviously automotive, and uh, yeah, the parting lines were critical because this is going to be seen by customers. So uh, these shutoffs had to be um, very tight. So any fluctuation in the substrate um, would affect the shutoff. Part could flash or uh, or damage itself as we're we're loading it into the overmold tool. Um, so this required a couple actions or hand loads to you know create these these shutoffs, especially on, on on this end and on the inside of this part. As you can see, the overmold spills into uh, this internal area of the part. Um, it looks simple on the outside, but um, yeah, there was a, a lot involved with it. You know, as John said, you know, and obviously it's based on the the part and the function and so forth. This being automotive, a seat belt, obviously everything is critical. We can't have flash. We can't have anything interfering with the, the fit and function of this piece. Again, the the ability to take that gray substrate piece and that to the steel tool or aluminum tool uh, is the most delicate part of the operation. It's kind of an art form to go in there and make sure the pieces fit. And John alluded to it, um, we have to produce obviously consistent substrate pieces every time without any variation in, in pack or, or uh, shrink or, or sink or anything to maintain that nice, clean, sharp shutoff all the way around this piece. So it's a difficult uh, job. You just have to approach it the right way and maintain the tool, very important. And uh, also the way this is demolded and handled at the press is critical. So we're not banging and clanging on any of the parting lines and anything like that. Uh, and the part came out looking really nice. Glenn, we have uh, several questions about this part. Um, the first is, What's considered a very tight tolerance for these parts? I think, John, you had mentioned that when you were talking about the tolerance um, for fitting into the overmold um, cavity. Well, I mean, the tolerance we're looking at here, I mean, uh, customer tolerances uh, range all over the place depending on the part. Uh, the tolerance we're talking about is the actual substrate um, and the fit to the tool uh, has to be almost perfect every time to get that nice clean edge, nice clean shut off, uh, no flash on your on your overmold material. Um, it's just a just a critical part of the operation to make sure that you've got a good fit with that substrate. Okay, a um, couple other questions. Um, are the ribs only on the green or also in the gray? Nope, they're, I, yeah, I think uh, someone asked to, to make the the green part transparent, which I did. So um, actually, I can show you what the substrate looks um, by itself. Actually, let me do this. So this is what the substrate prior to overmold what it looks like. So it's just a, a smooth surface. Um, the other challenge with this part was finding a material. Um, to adhere to the substrate um, because there really isn't any mechanical holds uh, for that overmold except for kind of around this area. And over time, you don't want to peel uh, of that overmold. So uh, we found a material that was matched with their substrate that was uh, chemically bonded to uh, this, this gray part. 
And that's a great segue, John, into another one of the questions. Um, could you touch on some of the types of overmold retention designs that you use and or like the most? And as you mentioned, we don't really see any of those mechanical holds here, but what are some of those that uh, we, we see and that work well? I mean, a lot of them are going to be pass-throughs uh, through the part, kind of as we saw in that first one. Um, you know, through holes where you can feed, you know, your gate from the inside of the part and feed the outside of the part for, for cosmetic parts. Um, uh, going back to the metal part where we had the groove within the part um, to, to hold the plastic from sliding off. I think we've got uh, another one, one here. We actually do have uh, on our site, there's probably a, a webinar you can download about overmolding, which is going to talk about a lot of that and, and, and shutoffs and different types and, and things to look for. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a lot of examples to show here and it's probably easier to show than to uh, speak to. Okay. I mean, some of the some of the mechanical holes can be simple holes and slots with not a whole lot of feature to them. Others, depending on the uh, application, may have a kind of a backdrafted dovetail shape to really hold that material back through the substrate and maintain that hold on the part. Uh, it really just comes down to the application, a simple groove or a hole or, or access point around the part is generally what we're looking for. Right. Now, there's, there's one other question before you guys move on, um, because you've yep. mentioned a couple times about shutoffs. Um, and sp specifically, this question is, how should a designer consider, consider overmold shutoffs? Well, I, I think uh, for us, anytime we can have a nice, sharp, clean line with lot, without a lot of uh, ups and downs and in and out and, and different uh, sharp features, uh, radiuses, but basically like on this, this that buckle part, it, it was a very simple outer perimeter, which lended itself to us being able to create a nice clean shut off. Um, but the simpler that edge uh, of the part, the substrate part and the tool, the, the sharper and cleaner that edge is, the better it'll be for the molding. Yeah, I mean, we can kind of zoom in here. So this actually had a bit of a groove that we, um, I don't know if you can see. There's actually a groove in here that, that created the shutoff between the, the substrate and the overmold that ran around. The same goes for this side. Um, you can kind of see into here. So that's one way. Um, and then, you know, inside here, it's just a, you know, we can probably just do this. So here you can kind of see the, the, the skeleton of, of how everything went together um, on this part and how everything just feeds into each other. So you've got this outer ring that feeds this inner ring and then feeds this, this upper uh, window ring. And those cylindrical features he's showing there are just the overmolded inserts that are in the part yep. as well. Yeah, those there. Yeah, but with that, that image right there really shows you the, the kind of track and flow that the material has to go through to fill this entire part. Yep. All right, let me switch screens here. So this next part, I mean, it's nothing too exciting. You know, the, the customer wanted to reduce part weight and, um, it's interesting, you know, the, the way it was done and just talk about parting lines. So let me pull that part up. All right. So again, I mean, this part came pretty much as a solid. Uh, it's a it's actually a pretty small part and the customer needed to to reduce weight and we worked with them and and kind of ended up with this final design you know being what it is we've got you know this this undercut uh that needed to be created so with that we had to have actions or hand loads um and came with that a, a parting line you know through the center apart you know 180 degrees from each other 
Um, and that had to be minimal just due to the function of this part. It's it's a pulley, um, you know, with um, essentially a rubber band. So anytime it hits hits a parting line or anything sharp, that that could affect that and in, in the life of the of the overall assembly or the the rubber um, band. So pretty straightforward. You can, you can see where the the customer went in and basically cut out large portions of the plastic to eliminate unnecessary waste on the weight and plastic and it uh, it's good for cost good for everything and they went around this entire part and took away any material they could um, you know if you put a cross section through it you can see that the material throughout the part is a little more uniform instead of you know, huge thick sec sections. You can look at that section right there. If those little cutouts on top and bottom weren't done, you just have a mass of plastic in there. And what that's going to do is it's going to remain hot. It's going to sink. It's going to distort and it's going to end up with a part you're not going to be happy with. So it's critical that you make sure you maintain that somewhat consistent wall thickness throughout the part anywhere you can. That's a, a big key in designing parts for plastic injection molding is a, a, is maintain as consistent a wall thickness as you can. Correct. All right, I don't see any questions, so we'll just keep going. Um, all right, so this next part is, um, just kind of showcasing a thread and one way to design your threads and, and be creative to get the thread engagement and not have to worry about parting lines, you know, kind of binding up um, when it's mating with the, it's mating part. So let me pull that one up. Threads are, threads are very challenging injection molding, and uh, as, as John said, in this particular case, uh, the customer was just looking for engagement of that uh, screw feature for the mating piece. It didn't have to be 360, a complete thread, so they were able to take off the side material so the tool could actually be built open and closed um, without a seam line directly across the threads which a seam line may or may not affect how tight or how loose that piece fits into its mating assembly. So it's a great design, a good, good way to, to get around potential issues of uh, some thread applications. Yeah, and just keep in mind when you're designing threads, uh, they're not designed the same as for metal. So um, plastic has its own set of rules when it comes to threads. Um, there's a lot of information online and, and on our site about that. All right. Uh, see any questions? We got a couple more parts here, and I think we're we've gone over just a, a little bit. But um, Mark, how are we on time? Do we want to continue on or? Yeah, yeah, we're fine. We can go, John. Okay. I think we only got uh, a couple more, so. Um, so this part, it, it's it's pretty small. It's a medical application. Um, the gray piece is the plastic, and that red little bar uh, to the bottom right there was actually over molded uh, into it. Um, so we'll bring that one up and, and talk about it. So with a, a very small, thin. Uh, pin shape uh, piece for the over molding process. Uh, first thing you gotta worry about is it flexing and moving inside the tool as the injection pressure comes in and, and fills around it. Um, this particular instance, we asked for uh, an extension of that piece um, so that it could be held positively in the tool from both ends, you know, not, not allowing it to flex and bend uh, too much in the tool. I mean, there's always going to be injection pressure on that, and these pieces will move. So, uh, whenever possible, we we always want to grab this piece from both sides and and not just grip it, say, from the right there, and it, it it'll probably flex like a fishing pole in there uh, once that injection pressure hits it. So, very important so that we maintain the position of that piece uh, during the overmold process. Yep. 
All right. Uh, let's see the question. So let's, uh, we got our last part here. Switch screens. So Glenn, I don't know if you want to touch on this one. Uh, just a beautiful part, uh, very challenging, but uh, we ended up with a very nice part, very clean, and you can see there's kind of those radial curved fins all the way around with uh, slot openings all the way around the part. Obviously, those are all shutoffs, um, very small, uh, very fine details, a um, lot to maintain there. Uh, gonna Usually on something like this, a possible application for steel just to maintain the nice sharp shutoffs. You got a lot of EDM work, a lot of machining on those fins that you don't want to have to re replace often. So, um, want to maintain good venting. All these thin features, the, the, the tendency is going to be to gas trap and uh, burn. Uh, we've got a lot of shutoffs, which also can be vented. Um, a lot of perimeter ejector pins underneath the piece to get that out of the tool nice and clean. Um, there's minimal draft on those fins, but just enough so that it'll pull out of the tool. It's a good design. Um, like I said, it was a challenge, uh, but our team uh, built a really nice tool and uh, we ended up with some really sharp looking parts from this. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that was the last part. John, if we can go uh, back to part number seven, which I believe was the uh, the thread. There is one question about that. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, how did you decide how deep to bring in the flat landing? Uh, that was actually the customer. Um, it, in, it, it's in, really just to... to make it so that it can be open and shut without a parting line seam across the thread so that the depth of it isn't as significant as actually having that flat there. They probably could have gone a little less, yeah. uh, but the customer made the decision on that, what would work, what would fit uh, their application. So it, it really is up to you and your design um, to make sure you do that uh, as minimal as necessary. And you know, again, you can go as far as you want. If you want a lighter part, go ahead and uh, take as much of that off as you want. As long as we have good engagement top and bottom on that thread, it'll still function as uh, designed. Right. All right, so folks, this, um, this wraps up uh, all nine parts that John and Glenn uh, have reviewed with us. If you have any other questions, please put them in the, uh, in the question field. We'll give it a moment. While you're doing that, um, I do want to point out uh, that there were several pieces of additional information that John and Glenn both referred to. We will include that in the email that will be sent out in a couple of days that will also include the recording to this. Um, we have a comment um, on part number nine, John and Glenn. It's, uh, it says, <laughs> wow, how much was the tooling cost for part nine? Impressive. That is an impressive part. Um, I don't remember the exact cost offhand, but um, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, uh, it 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 wasn't too bad, um, but it wasn't cheap either. A lot going on on that part. Uh, very fine details on the on the pieces, steel where necessary, which is more expensive. Uh, just materials and machining and so forth. So. Uh, but in the end, uh, customer got a good part here. And they also asked, do you remember what the cycle time was on that part? It wasn't actually too bad. I mean, it's it's pretty much open close. There was no actions. If we're still talking about part number nine, yes. Um, you know, it was it was probably under a minute. Uh, yeah, I would I would say anywhere from forty five seconds to a minute, maybe something in that range. Now, in regards to the other one with the eight, nine hand loads, that was a little bit different. That was a, a couple minute one. All right. Well, I see no other questions coming in. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, this was uh, very informative and a great discussion. Thank you for everybody who attended and, and asked questions.
We want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the recording within uh, a couple of days. And as I said, I will also make sure that we include links to the additional information that John and Glenn uh, mentioned. Um, if you have any questions about today's topic uh, after we, uh, we close, please make sure you email us at info at eccentricmold.com. Also be sure to follow us on LinkedIn so that you can, you'll be getting um, updates on our additional um, future webinars and, um, and blogs. Have a great day, everybody.